Hello and welcome to Digest This for focused clinical updates in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, one of the gastro trainees in the west of Scotland, and today the focus is on Barrett's esophagus. I'm delighted to welcome Dr Ian Penman, a consultant gastroenterologist here at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh with a special interest in Barrett's esophagus. Dr Penman, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Barrett's esophagus, as we know, is replacement of the distal squamous epithelium with columnar metaplasia. But why is it important? Well, it's important because it's the main risk factor that's been identified for esophageal adenocarcinoma development. And the kind of squamous columnar dysplasia cancer sequence is well established. And we know that cancer of the esophagus, adenocarcinoma is getting more and more common. It's gone up about sevenfold in the last 20 or 30 years. And therefore that has led to surveillance programs to monitor Barrett's in an effort to try and prevent dysplasia and cancer development. And is there a way to predict those who are at highest risk of cancer development in Barrett's? Well, there's never been any randomised trials that show that endoscopic surveillance is effective or cost effective, but nonetheless, it is widely practiced throughout the world. Now, part of the problem is that estimates of what that risk is have been very variable, and studies in the past have been plagued by being single centre, small, retrospective, short follow-up periods, and I think the feeling is that they've probably overestimated the cancer risk. So 10 or 15 years ago, we worked on the basis that the cancer risk in someone with Barrett's was about 0.5% per year. One in 200 would progress to cancer. And there were studies that suggested that in Scotland, that risk was even higher, might even be as high as 1%. But more recent national database studies, population-based studies, mainly from Denmark, but also from the States and from Northern Ireland, show that the risk is probably a lot lower, probably in the region of 0.1 or at most 0.2%. So, in fact, surveillance strategies need to take that into account. Now, that risk is not uniform for all patients with Barrett's. We are getting closer to understanding why some patients are more at risk of progression than others. So the key thing is whether there is dysplasia present. So people with dysplasia uh, at any stage in their Barrett's uh, life are much higher risk of progressing to cancer. So people with low grade dysplasia, maybe over about five years, 20% of them will progress to cancer. People with high grade dysplasia are at much greater risk. And probably 40% of them will develop cancer within the next two or three years. For people who don't have dysplasia, risk can be stratified a little bit as well, using a combination of clinical and endoscopic features. We know that people with long segments of Barrett's are at greater risk of progressing. We know that men are at much higher risk than women of progressing to cancer. We know that age is important, so people over the age of 50 and lastly, obesity is a major risk factor. So I think there is some evidence, it's not really strong evidence, but it's emerging and at a clinical practical level, I think surveillance should be intensified around the group of people who are men, over 50, obese, with long segments of Barrett's. And they should have more intensive, more frequent surveillance than say, for example, women with very short segments of Barrett's, in whom we know the risk is much lower. Next, we've looked at biomarkers. Are there any molecular features or histological features or other biomarkers we can use to predict cancer risk? They're still at the research stage. Uh, they're not ready for routine clinical use. Probably the only one that one could stand behind as a clinical biomar a, a, a molecular biomarker would be the presence of p53 abnormalities on immunostaining. And what they do is help you help pathologists uh, diagnose and assess the presence of dysplasia on biopsies. 
So P53 staining should be considered for routine use by pathologists when looking at Barrett's biopsies, especially when they're equivocating about whether or not there's any dysplasia present. But the other biomarkers are still some way off. So how do you put all of that together into a surveillance strategy? Well, I think the BSG, British Society of Gastroenterology Guidelines, published about 18 months ago uh, in early 2014, have got that about right. So we stratify patients into those who have long or short segments, uh, three centimetres or more, or less than three centimetres. If you have long segment Barrett's with intestinal metaplasia, no dysplasia, then surveillance should occur every two to three years. If you have a short segment of Barrett's, that's three centimetres or less, with intestinal metaplasia, then the surveillance interval can be a little longer and the BSG guidelines recommend somewhere between three and five years. If you have short segment Barrett's but no intestinal metaplasia, then the risk is probably a lot less. We think that it is the presence of intestinal metaplasia that conveys a lot of the risk. Intestinal metaplasia, however, is a patchy change. It's not uniform throughout the, bio, throughout the Barrett segment, and it may just be that the lack of it represents sampling error. And so the recommendation is that if it's a short segment of Barrett's with no intestinal metaplasia and biopsy, you should repeat the procedure. And if a second time there is no intestinal metaplasia, that patient probably doesn't require long-term surveillance because their long-term risk is very, very low. That would be roughly the framework for structuring a surveillance programme. Now we've taken that one step forward here and what we do, and again this is pragmatic and not truly evidence-based, is that, as you know, people are often diagnosed with Barrett's when they come for their first ever endoscopy because they've got reflux or other symptoms. It may be done uh, without them being on any treatment, such as a proton pump inhibitor. It may be a throat spray endoscopy that they might not tolerate. They might not have a full set of four quadrant biopsies taken, and yet Barrett's has been discovered. I believe that's too soon and too premature to put them straight into a surveillance program. So once you've made that diagnosis of Barrett's, we see the patient once, talk to them, inform them, give them information, find out what they want to do, assess their fitness for ongoing surveillance. And then within the next year, we scope them again. So in the space of 12 months, they've had two endoscopies. We've really mapped out the length of their Barrett's and been able to accurately risk stratify them. If there was dysplasia there, we think we would have found it on two endoscopies. We can be confident about whether or not there's intestinal metaplasia. And on the basis of that, we put them into surveillance. And because we've done it twice in the first year, we use the longer of the, the range of intervals. So we would move short segment Barrett's patients out to five years and long segment ones out to three years. So you end up doing more endoscopy up front to secure the diagnosis and the right information, but then you can put them into longer intervals and fewer endoscopies, we believe, safely. Um, how do we get the most out of the endoscopy when we're surveying patients with Barrett's? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, and I, I'm, I'm accused of going on and on about this a lot. But if you take the parallel with colonoscopy, there's so much focus now on quality, on documentation, on good bowel preparation, good mucosal visualisation, and and spotting pathology carefully and dealing with it. And the same should happen in Barrett's. So you need a well-prepared patient who knows what they're coming for at endoscopy, who's given the option of throat spray or sedation because they need to tolerate the procedure comfortably and well to give the endoscopist time and peace to do a good job. The mucosa needs to be clean by that I mean two things. There shouldn't be any ongoing esophagitis. So the patient needs to be established on effective acid suppression. The presence of esophagitis 
makes the interpretation of the appearances difficult for the endoscopist and even harder for the pathologist because it can induce changes of atypia and can make it harder for the pathologist to say one way or the other whether there's dysplasia present. But in addition, the mucosa needs to be cleaned by washing it. So we give patients a, a 50 ml drink of a, a sort of a lemon juice with uh, cymethicone in it to just break down bubbles and break down mucus and clear the view before they come in the room. You need to use the best quality endoscope you've got. It doesn't have to be fancy. Ideally, it should be a high definition endoscope. You need to take time. There are some studies that suggest that the detection of dysplasia is better, greater, if doctors or nurses who are doing endoscopy take an average of one minute per centimetre of Barrett's segment to assess it. So I think the, the, the sort of dogma we're moving to is spend more time looking and less time just randomly biopsying. It's very easy on a busy service list to get sucked into believing you've got to hurry, we've got to get on with the biopsies, because that's the bit that takes the time. I would argue that wash the mucosa, assess the segment properly, document it carefully, look at it thoroughly, and target your biopsies. One area to target is if you look at the endoscopic image as a sort of clock face, is the area between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of all the dysplasia that you'll find is in that quadrant. So with a scope in a neutral position, the numbers of, on the barrel of the scope, the shaft of the scope, pointing upwards, then you look between 12 and 3 o'clock. And if I was to advise anyone where to be looking and where to be sampling, that's where your biggest yield is. So spend a lot of time looking. Do we need to do anything fancy? No, there was a great vogue seven or eight years ago for enhanced endoscopy or advanced endoscopy using things such as narrowband imaging or FICE, even autofluorescence and chromoendoscopy. These have largely failed to demonstrate their superiority to good quality white light endoscopy with a high definition scope in a well-prepared patient and an endoscopist who knows what they're doing and invests the time. The one thing I think people should do is consider the use of acetic acid. So acetic acid, some people rudely call it vinegar, but it is acetic acid. But actually all you need is vinegar. Go down to your local supermarket or speak through your pharmacy. Most acetic acid solutions or vinegars are about 7% strength. That gets diluted down to 1.5% sprayed down a spray catheter uh, and it turns the surface mucosa white and it enhances the view of the topography of the mucosa. There are good studies that show that when those white areas lose their aceto whitening very quickly within about a minute, a minute and a half and turn pink or red that those correlate with areas of dysplasia. So it takes about a minute to spray the mucosa. It takes about a minute to let the effect develop and to watch and then wait for about 90 seconds. And any little red patches that reappear should be targeted for biopsy. Now, the data out there are very, very compelling, I believe. But they're done by experts in expert centers as part of research studies. And what we haven't yet got is enough information to say that if you do that and only take targeted biopsies, you no longer need to do the standard four quadrant, two centimetre biopsies. I think we'll get there in time, but we don't have the data yet. And endoscopists, I would encourage them to use acetic acid and target abnormal areas first, but then they still have to do the four quadrant biopsy protocol. So let's say you've taken time, prepared the patient as you suggest, bought some vinegar, had a good look, and you do identify an abnormality. What do you want to know when patients are referred to you? Well, bugbear number two for me is the fact that these get referred here as, uh, as a nodule. And that doesn't tell me anything that I need to know. A small nodule isn't much help. 
clinicians need to develop a dictionary, a, 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 a language that they can use to describe lesions so that we each know what we're facing and dealing with. And so it improves communication. Secondly, an accurate structured description of the abnormality can help predict what that lesion is and its aggressiveness. So the first thing I would want from uh, a referral in a patient who's been found to have a lesion is an accurate description of the Barrett's itself using the Prague criteria. They've been around for 10 or 15 years now, uh, are easy to remember, and if endoscopists can't, there's a drawing they can print out and put on the wall, which just documents the length of the Barrett's, how much circumferential there is, and how much there is in the way of tongues and islands and where the landmarks are. For the lesion itself, I would want to know at what distance it is from the incisors, what size it is, and what position on the clock face it's on. Secondly, I'd want to know what's called the Paris classification. Again, if you don't remember what it is, it's easy to just print the cartoon out and put it on the endoscopy room wall. The reason the Paris classification is useful is the fact that Paris type 1 lesions are essentially polyps. They're polypoid or sessile polyps. Paris type 3 lesions are ulcers. You can't mucosally resect an ulcer. And it's a shame for a patient to be led to believe that their disease might be endoscopically treatable, to maybe travel a distance to a centre to have that done, when in fact an accurate description up front even if it's a small lesion, that it was an ulcer, would have told us, can't do this. So what you're really focusing on is the Paris type 2 lesions. Those are flat lesions. And it's flat lesions that are most suitable to endoscopic therapy. Polypoid type 1 lesions, probably suitable for endoscopic therapy, but not the type 3 ones. And can you say a little bit about EMR? Yeah. EMR is now well established in the esophagus, been around for a while. The equipment to help endoscopists do it has been standardised. Um, it is a safe procedure. Uh, people who undertake EMR in the colon often shy away from doing it in the esophagus because of a perception that it's high risk for both bleeding and perforation, when in fact the opposite is true uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, it is, it is very rare to cause co major complications and the data out there support that. There are essentially two different types of device to help do EMR in the esophagus. Uh, one is the uh, band and ligate technique. So one of the companies makes a, essentially a variceal banding ligator that attaches to the scope you suck the lesion up and band it and create a pseudopolyp. And there's a, a specific hexagonal snare that comes with the kit, which goes down inside the bander, and you basically snare off below the band. And you can take multiple overlapping pieces. EMR is useful for two reasons. One, it is the best staging tool. So it is more accurate than endoscopy and it is more accurate than EUS at determining whether the lesion, if it's cancer, has invaded the submucosa. So it really is the only way to get gold standard pathological staging of the disease, and I'll come back to that, why that's important in a minute. But in addition, it's therapeutic, in that if you clear the entire lesion, and the pathology confirms that it was confined to the mucosa, with no vertical depth into the submucosa or only just into the upper submucosa, then the chances of that patient having mediastinal node involvement is probably in the region of less than 5%, somewhere between 2 and 5%. And unless there are other adverse histological features, endoscopic therapy has probably been curative. If the mucosal resection shows that disease is substantially into the submucosa, then the EMR should be regarded as non-curative because the patient has somewhere between a 25 and 40% node involvement risk. And they now need to have other therapy, surgery if they're fit, 
or chemoradiotherapy if they're not. And what about the segment of Barrett's? How, how do you approach that in a visible lesion? So if you have a small, early, visible lesion in Barrett's, well, once you've taken the lesion away and got your pathology and confirmed that endoscopic therapy has probably been curative for that lesion, you still have the background field defect of the Barrett's, which is unstable. And we would wait until the EMR site has healed up, usually about six or eight weeks, and the patient then comes back for ablation of the rest of their Barrett segment. Now there are several ways you can ablate the Barrett segment. You can do it by photodynamic therapy, you can do it by APC, but the data out there that are most convincing because they've been the best studied and through simplicity of procedure is for radiofrequency ablation. Well, what about the different situation then where you've inspected the Barrett segment, it looks okay, but when you get the biopsy results back, you pick up low-grade or worse, high-grade dysplasia. What's your approach? So that's a common finding. So patients are not seen to have any visible abnormality at their surveillance endoscopy, but the biopsies come back showing dysplasia. Now, for high-grade dysplasia, the evidence is fairly clear that these people are at fairly high risk of progressing to cancer in the next two or three years. And most national, international guidelines would recommend that surveillance stops and that you intervene with therapy. And that therapy would usually be by radiofrequency ablation. RFA has been around since 2007, 2008. It's well established. It's got a very strong evidence base from randomized trials that it can both ablate and eradicate all of the dysplasia in about 90% of patients. It can reduce the chances of progression to cancer substantially over the coming three to five years. And it can actually eradicate all of the Barrett's leading to squamous regeneration. Follow up of these patients for up to five years shows that when it works, those changes, those benefits are durable up to five years. There are still lingering concerns that you might get dysplasia recurring underneath the new squamous epithelium. But actually, if patients are kept under careful surveillance after RFA, then nearly all the recurrences that you find are small and amenable to further endoscopic therapy, either by APC or more RFA or by EMR. For low-grade dysplasia, that's much more contentious. A multi-centre trial known as the SURF trial, SURF-1 and SURF-2, randomised patients to RFA or sham treatment for their low-grade dysplasia. They showed a real benefit for RFA in eradicating low-grade dysplasia and preventing progression to cancer. I think the criticism of that study was that although the results were very strongly statistically significant and very impressive, that actually the cancer progression rate in the sham arm was very high, higher than in many other studies. Uh, and that's led people to query the validity of that study. However, NICE and the BSG have recommended that patients with low-grade dysplasia should be treated by RFA. The issue is, for me, that low-grade dysplasia is so common that that is a lot of people possibly requiring treatment. Low-grade dysplasia is very difficult even for experienced specialist GI pathologists to be accurate about diagnosing. And I think that RFA, although generally well tolerated, is still an invasive procedure. It might take three or four procedures. People can be left with odynophagia and discomfort. There's a 5% stricture rate that needs dilatations. And it's expensive. We would estimate that probably in both direct and indirect costs, probably costs about £9,000 to eradicate one patient's long segment Barrett's with dysplasia. So my own personal view is that the jury is still out you might believe that 
patients with low-grade dysplasia are at significant risk of progression, but that risk is maybe 15-20% over five years. That means that 80-85% of patients will not progress over five years. And if they do and are kept under careful surveillance, one argument might be that, well, you'll spot them when they get to high grade and then you can def definitely intervene. So I think we're still awaiting more cost-effectiveness studies and larger studies on the use of RFA for low-grade dysplasia. I think the final thing I would say is there's low-grade and there's low-grade. If you have a young adult, 40 to 50, with long segment Barrett's and multifocal low-grade dysplasia present throughout the segment on several occasions, then I think that's something that we would want to treat because they are at higher risk than perhaps an elderly patient with comorbidity, a short segment of Barrett's, maybe low grade in one or two biopsies. That patient, I think, I would prefer con to continue surveying. And if you embark on RFA, how often do you do it and how do you follow these patients up? Most centres would follow the original research studies in their protocol. So patients have RFA at time zero, at three months, at six months. So every three months until all the disease is eradicated. And it's very variable. Some people need one session of treatment, but on average people with long segment Barrett's would need three treatments. That would be zero, three and six months. We would then scope them at nine months and at one year. And at one year, 12 months from the start of treatment, make a decision on whether we had eradicated all their dysplasia and eradicated all their Barrett's by taking systematic biopsies from the site of the original Barrett's. And that's your 12 month marker of efficacy and treatment success. Okay. Thereafter, we would follow them six monthly in year two and then annually out to five years. Thank you. Let me leave you with a final challenge, which is to give us some key messages to take away with us on Barrett's esophagus. Well, I think the key message would not be to focus on the technological developments, RFA and EMR, but to do the basics really well, to be interested in Barrett's because it's the main risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma to spend time doing the endoscopy, to document the findings carefully, use the PRAG criteria. If you find a lesion, use the Paris classification to describe it, to wash the mucosa, to assess it carefully, to consider using acetic acid, and to take targeted biopsies, to increase the yield of dysplasia, because that's the way we'll help people with Barrett's. So I think the key message would be to structure your surveillance programs, inform your patients, standardise how you do things, and do the simple things really well. That would be message number one. Thank you, Dr Penman, for a clear and very helpful summary on an important topic. The pleasure. And thank you for joining us for Digest This.